chapter 24. Um, I'm going to start. Okay. The reading is between 13 and 34. And I'm not going to read all that to y'all today. Uh, I'm going to talk about all that today. But I'm not going to read all that. I'm only going to read from chapter what verse cha- chapter 24, verse 19. I'm going to start at 19, and I'm going to go down through 31. And then I will tell y'all what's happening. This is the story of the men on the road of Emmaus. This is actually a post-Easter message. That lets you know right now my stuff's not scripted because I missed this one all together. Um, this is after he has risen, uh, just days after. And uh, anyway, they're walking down the road and, and, and they're talking. These two men are talking. Uh, some scriptures call them disciples, but they were definitely followers of Jesus. And they're walking and having this conversation. And Jesus suddenly appears upon them and says, hey, what y'all talking about? And then they gave him this whole discussion about, man, you know, must not be the only person in Jerusalem that haven't heard what's going on. And, and, and then they say, Jesus says, what? What things? And this is what we're going to pick up here today in chapter 24, verse 19. If y'all can just stand with me for just for a little bit, amen, because I'll stand a little bit longer than you standing. Um, the Bible says, Jesus said, verse 19, you got to, there you go, in red. It said, what things? So once again, they had said, you must be the only person in Jerusalem that haven't heard the things that happened in Jerusalem. And Jesus says, like he don't know. What things? This is three days after he got up. And so, so they talking about it, and all of a sudden they disappear. He in the middle of the conversation, what y'all talking about? And they said, man, you must be the only dude I know that don't know what's going on, the things that happened in Jerusalem. And Jesus says in verse, chapter 19, verse 19, he says, what things? And, and Jesus asked, and then the things that happened to Jesus. <laughs> Jesus asked what things? And they said the things that happened to you, but they didn't know who he was. The things that happened to Jesus. Oh, let me back up. When they got there, they did not recognize him as Jesus. God, God stopped their vision where they couldn't see that it was Jesus. They saw a man, they didn't recognize him as Jesus. All right. He said, what things, Jesus asked. And these things that happened to Jesus, the man from Nazareth, they said, he was a prophet who did powerful miracles, and he was a mighty teacher in the eyes of God and all the people. But our leading priest and other religious leaders handed him over to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. Check out verse 21. They said, we had hoped he was the Messiah who had come to rescue Israel. This all happened three days ago. Then some women from our group of followers were at his tomb early, in, early this morning. And they came back with an amazing report. They came back with the amazing report. They said, this is what they said. They said his body was missing. And they had seen angels who told them that Jesus is alive. Some of our men, some of our men ran out to sea and sure enough, his body was gone. Just as the women had said. Then Jesus said to them, you foolish people. You, you, you find it so hard to believe all the prophets, what the, all the prophets wrote in the scriptures. Wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering his glory? Then Jesus took them through the written writings of Moses and all the prophets, explaining from all the scriptures the things concerning himself. <laughs> By this time, they were nearing Emmaus. That was a seven-mile journey, walking. By this time, they were nearing Emmaus, and at the end of their journey, and Jesus acted as if he was going on. But they begged him, hey, hey, man, stay the night with us since it's getting late. So he went home with them. As they sat down to eat, he took bread and blessed it. Then he broke it and gave it to them. Let me say that again. As he sat down to eat, he took the bread. He blessed it. He broke it and gave it to them. And suddenly, somebody say suddenly. Suddenly their eyes were open and they recognized him. At that moment, he disappeared. Jesus said, oh, you foolish people. Before I got to that verse, before I got there, the Bible says they were, they were talking about Jesus and their faces were sad. 
So Jesus looked at them like, you foolish people. Can I, can I tell you what we just read here? Th- this high came to me. Uh, and then y'all, after I say this, and I give you a title, y'all can sit down for a little while, then I'm going to talk for a little bit, then y'all can stand up, then we get dismissed, all right? So, so this is what I see. We, let me show you what you just read. We just read a story about two men who were a part of the church, right? And, and they walked close enough to the church that they reaped the benefits of the presence of God, right? They fellowship with the brethren. They heard the teachings of Jesus. They saw the miracles. They listened to all the testimonies. They worked around the other believers long enough to be recognized by the other believers. And when people would inquire of them, oh, what is your relationship with Jesus? They were kind of men who would proudly say, hey, I know the man. Right. Ladies, they were the kind of men that you wouldn't be ashamed to take home to meet the parents. That's what we see on the surface. But they were also the kind of men who struggle to hang around when you're going through your season of suffering. They are the type of men who aren't afraid to cut you off once they've gotten all that they believe that they could get out of you. They're the type of men who would define you by what they want you to be in their lives. And if you don't live up to their self-gratifying expectations, they'll turn away and walk away from you. At the very moment, they should be celebrating you as you come into your glory. They're the kind of men that will tell you uh, uh, that when you tell them the truth, they let you tell them the truth, but at the same time, they walk away from you like you told them a lie. They're the kind of men that know enough scripture to sound holy, but not enough scripture to hold to his teachings. They're the kind of men that Jesus Christ himself came as close to biblical cussing as you could do when he called them fools. Do y'all know anybody like that? You don't have to say nothing. Today's message is simply this. I've got to get my life together. Come on, sir. Say that with me. I get my life Father God, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your presence. I thank you for, ooh, basking here with us right now. Going, We're basking in your glory. We thank you for all that you're doing, all that you have done, and all that you're going to do. Lord, I, I pray that this word is relevant. Not just a good sounding word, but relevant. Lord, we need help. We need to get ourselves together. And we need you to help us. So, Lord God, as I bring forth this word, Lord God, word in my mouth. Give me what to say, how to say, when to say it, Lord God. And open our ears that we can hear what the Spirit has to say. And we give you all praise. We give you all glory. We give you all honor. Oh, and don't let me waste your time. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. On your way down, say, I got to get my life together. <laughs> uh, some of y'all meant that when y'all said that, too. Amen. And help me, Lord. I got to get my life together. Uh, I just realized we never sung to the March birthday, so we're going to do it again next week. Um, So you say we can do it at the end. We, I, I don't want to interrupt service like that. And so we, we, we just do march all over again next week. Um, <laughs> all right, if I remember, we do it at the end. I got to get my life together. I got to, I got to get my life together. Have you ever had that moment that you realize you thought things were going well, then you realize it wasn't going as well as you thought it was going, and then you... Like, man, I got to get my life together. Have you ever saw somebody else, man, they got their stuff together and it hit you to the point like, yeah, dog, I need to get my life together. Man, we came from the same cut and doggone, they, they doing well, I'm doing bad. I got to get. I'm talking about grown-ups. I'm not talking about children. We know how to be holy, Tim. We know how to dance. We know how to raise our hands. We know how to clap and stomp and do all that stuff. And, and then we realize we just as messed up as the world. The only difference between them and the world is we go to church on Sundays. Mm-hmm. I, I got I to I get my life together. I, I, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm about to be double nickels. I got to get my life together. I'm, 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 I've been doing the same thing for a long time, thinking I'm going to get different results. I got to get my life together. 
I've been thinking that being near the church is the same as being part of the church. I, 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 got, to, I got to get my life together. I wouldn't know the presence of God if he smacked me in the face. I got to get. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. So do you know that um, there are many in our society who do not believe in the Bible? And nor do they believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. They do not believe that he is the only way of salvation. And what they do, Pastor Tim, they demand foolproof evidence before they will believe. That's what they say. I need foolproof evidence that he real before I believe. And, and I don't have a problem with that because there is plenty of evidence, a huge amount of evidence that clearly proves that Jesus Christ is exactly who he claims to be. Mm -hmm. Years ago, I read a book called The Case for Christ by Lee Strobel. It was, it was a fascinating book to me, uh, A Case for Christ, The Case for Christ. And, and, and at the time that he wrote the, was writing the book uh, or, or doing his studies, he was an atheist, right? And, and he wrote the book as an investigative study where he just believed that his findings, findings would bring Christianity's claim about Jesus tumbling down like a house of cards. Well, he was wrong. He, he was absolutely wrong. His journey led him to, uh, uh, from skepticism to faith. His journey led him from being an atheist to being a pastor. And for, for which he, that which he set out to disprove was only proven that much more to be true. Yeah, he was trying to make sure. I'm going to show these Christians, this, this God y'all serving, he's not real. And as he investigated, he got more evidence that he was real, more than he thought was out there. And, and what I'm saying is this turnaround is one that you would hope any skeptic would have when the truth is revealed to them. But disturbingly, what we find is that there are a great number of people who still refuse to believe. They refuse to believe, even when they're faced with very solid, convincing evidence that proves that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and the Savior of the world. They still refuse to believe. And then when they look at us, those who are committed to God, they think that we're just gullible enough to accept the message of the Bible on nothing but blind faith. Hmm. Well, I can tell you personally, I have not accepted God's word just on blind faith faith because uh, I searched for the truth of the gospel. I, I searched for the truth of the gospel. Uh, there was a moment in my life I had to go search for the truth of the gospel. Uh, when I first got to college, that's when the, the, the Malcolm X movie had just come out and, and, and consistently the Muslim was on the campus and, and you had uh, uh, Farrakhan, Minister Louis Farrakhan on campus quite often and, and everybody said, this is the way you serve in the white man's God and this, that, and another. And white Christianity is all for it and you didn't have no part of it. So I I had to search. I had to search for the truth. But, but while I was searching, I was being respectful of the gospel because my parents had always lived in accordance with the gospel before me. So, so I went to try to prove that this was real, right? Not to prove that it was not real. So I wanted to go prove that what I had been taught my whole life was real. So either way, either way, I had questions. And I investigated and I found that there are some real historical, biblical evidences that prove the validity of God's word and the reality of the cross and the resurrection. I'm talking about proofs that line up with history, that line up with science, that line up with literature, that line up with religious uh, re revelation. It's all well documented. Yeah. Right? So y'all know right now we're in what we call the Easter season. It's Easter season. It's where we remember and celebrate the resurrection of Jesus from the tomb, which was done to set us free from the penalty of our sin. And, and I believe that there's plenty of convincing evidence that speaks to us of this reality, right? And one of them being the testimony of countless millions whose lives were forever changed by the message of the cross and the reality of the tomb. And the Bible says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, they say you will be saved. 
That's Romans 10 and 9. Now, now I like that scripture. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I like that scripture. But, but this scripture now uh, connects the deliverance of our soul directly to your ability to believe the evidence that has been presented before you that Jesus got up from the grave. Tell somebody, if you don't mind, talk for just a minute. Say, you just need to believe. Now say this, and, and then you too will become a witness to his living reality. Yeah, you just, you just need to believe, and then you can become a witness to his reality. Millions that have come before me have testified of the goodness of God, and I don't think they all got together at one time and made up this lie. It's not only us who celebrate Jesus, y'all, if you don't get it twisted. But, but millions have come before us. Anthony Brown sung this song. He said, I'm a living, breathing, walking, talking, moving miracle. David and Nicole Binion, they said, I am living proof. God is on the move. There's nothing he can't do. Faith, rise up. They said, faith, rise up. I am a walking, talking, living, breathing, hallelujah. <laughs> Tell somebody, I'm living proof. You didn't say it like you believe. It. I'm living proof. That Jesus is alive. Say, I'm living proof. Mm -hmm. I said that to say this. The Bible is filled with, with all kinds of stories and, and stories of miracle working power of God. But the greatest miracle is the salvation of a soul for eternal life. Y'all don't believe me. Y'all don't believe me. I just said some words. Y'all got mad about it. Yeah, that's a great miracle. But the greatest miracle is the salvation of souls to, to what? To live eternally. And this is the miracle that God wants to happen in your life. And this is the miracle that God wants to happen in the lives of people that you love. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. Now, now, if you were to look at historical documents, you would find, like I said, millions of men and women through the centuries who have sacrificed their lives, their bodies, and all that they have because they knew in their souls the truth that Jesus is, in fact, the eternal son of the living God. Yeah. And you can go look at all the documents, but I'm going to give you all something real easy to do. I am one of them. I am one of them. I am one of the witnesses that he could change your life. I am one of the witnesses that he could save your soul. I am one of the witnesses. So you don't have to go read all this stuff. You can if you want to, but I am one of them. Can anybody else testify that I am? Okay, 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 okay. Therefore, if you are like me, we know that we have this great responsibility to show forth the hand of God in our lives despite what you may be going through. You don't only praise God when you got stuff going well in your life. You praise God when things aren't going so well in your life. Uh -uh, you don't only praise God when you're able to knock on heaven's door, but you praise God when your toenails are touching hell's pit. Because, because, listen, one of the greatest witnesses that you could have, catch this, one of the greatest witnesses that you could have is how you look on this side of the trauma. How you look on this side of the tragedy. Man, they went through some stuff, but man, they still give God praise. They, they still got a smile on their face. They, they, still, they just lost somebody real close to them, but they still able to lift up the name of Jesus. They, they still able to praise God. They still find their way into the church. You mean, you mean they, no matter what they've been through? Yeah, how you look is one of the greatest testimonies on this side of the, on this side of the trauma. Matter of fact, tell somebody, in some cases... Say that with me. Say, in some cases, seeing is all the evidence you need. Y'all missed that. In, in some cases, Pastor Tim, seeing is all the evidence you need. Okay, here we go. If they told you, you went out there and said, hey, y'all know that pastor over there on Cooper Street, Pastor Corey Pryor? Man, he cut up. He is locked up. If you see me walk up to you, you can say, no, he ain't. Because seeing is all the evidence that you need. If they tell you, hey, 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 you know, Corey, uh, 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 he got in a car accident and he died. You're like, oh, my goodness. And then I come up to, hey, what's up, doc? Seeing is all the evidence that you need. No, 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 no. I know, I know that she would say seeing is, but, but I'm saying in some cases, seeing is all the evidence that you need. They say, hey, man, Corey done lost his mind. He decided he's going to go ahead and brighten his skin up like Michael Jackson. And then you see me. You say, 
That boy just as chocolate as chocolate can be. Why? Because seeing is all the evidence you need. Okay, here's the story. Here's the story. Let me see if I can remember the story. I'm going to try to remember the story that was curling. So, so, okay, here. The story is that there was a man. He was out crabbing, which means he was out hunt, uh, fishing for crab. He was, he was crabbing. And it was illegal to do in the river that he was in. That's the key thing you didn't know. It was illegal to be crabbing in the river that he was in. But he was crabbing, and the ranger saw him crabbing in the river. And he walked up to him and said, hey, you're under arrest said, for what? For, for crabbing in the river, poaching crabs. And he had the crab in his hand. And he said, I'm not crabbing. And he said, do you think I'm a fool? He said, no, 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 I'm not crabbing. This is my pet crab. And ever so often, I come down to the river to let him swim. He said, that's your pet crab, and you come down here to let your pet crab swim. Yes. And so the man who was just caught with the crab in his hand lowered the crab down into the water, and they both stood back and watched the crab. I don't know why I did that. Well, watched the crab <laughs> swim away. And they both stood there, just standing, and finally the ranger said, what happened to your pet crab? And the man said, yeah, when is he coming back? And the man said, the man that had just been caught yeah. with the crab in his hand yeah. that was caught poaching in the river he was not supposed to be in, he looked at that ranger dead in his face. He said, what crab? <laughs> the man believed if you see no crab, I have, you have no evidence. But we all understand that sometimes seeing is all the evidence that you need. I know I saw you with the crab. Which brings me to my text. We didn't read this, but uh, verse 13 says, it says, Two of Jesus' followers were walking to the village of Emmaus. Let me get some water. <coughs> mm. Mm. Yeah, it said two of Jesus' followers were walking to the village of Emmaus, <coughs> seven miles from Jerusalem. And as they walked, they were talking about everything that had happened. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, there it is. <coughs> Let, let's put a pen right there real quick. They were discussing all that they had seen over the weekend. <clears throat> and according to what they saw, it appears that they were now traumatized by what they reasoned in their mind as a murder of their friend. Mm -hmm. look, 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 they had seen Jesus do the miraculous, but now they just witnessed him killed like a criminal. Mm -hmm. now, now, as any uh, uh, one of us would be at the back end of what we saw to believe as a complete injustice to someone that we cared about, they were saddened, right? They, they, they were saddened because and, 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 what they had witnessed just didn't make sense. It, it really didn't make sense. They had just, Jesus had just been beaten and crucified, check this, for something that the court found him innocent of. The court found him innocent of all charges. And then they turned it over to the people. Who do you want, Barabbas or Jesus? Who, who should get it? And they said, Jesus. Okay, okay. And so they killed him. And then they placed him in a tomb. But then these two men, they heard from people that they supposedly trusted that early Sunday morning, he got up. Woo! Hear me, hear me, hear me, hear me, hear me. They had saw him die. They saw him put him in the tomb, them put him in the tomb. But now they weren't there to see this part. But people that they said that they trusted verified that they saw that the tomb was empty. And that meant that the stone was rolled away. And the tomb being empty meant that Jesus had gotten up. Just like he said he would. He got up with all power in his hand. Right, 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 right. And, and so, so now they're headed from Jerusalem to Emmaus, and this is what they're talking about. 
And, and just about that time in their conversation in verse 15, the Bible says Jesus himself suddenly came and began to walk with them. Yeah. Somebody say suddenly. Jesus suddenly came and began to walk with them, but God kept them from recognizing him. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. A few weeks ago, if y'all remember, I told you that when the Syrian army came to get Elisha, that they could see him, but they could not see him for who he was. Right? And I call that then, I call it, I call it God's concealment plan. It's where God makes it where you cannot see what God does not want you to see. Here, they could see Jesus, but they couldn't see Jesus for who he was. And in this anonymity, Jesus asked the question. He said, what y'all talking about? <laughs> now, now, we're made privy to the tone of this discussion because the Bible actually says he asked it like this. He said, what are you discussing, verse 17, discussing so intently as you walk along? Hmm, here's the thing. I say this every time I read about Jesus, God asking a question. Uh, he has no need to ask <laughs> a question. There's nothing he does not know. Hmm. He's not the all wondering God. <laughs> he is the all knowing God. He is the omniscient God. So Jesus asked a question and the Bible says they stopped with sadness written across their faces. That's verse 17 as well. So, so what I find out, found out is that he's not asking a question to gain information, not information for himself. No, he's asking this question to engage in the conversation with them so that he can later enlighten them to a greater truth. Stick with me for a minute, y'all. It's going to make sense in just a second. So, so, so because of Jesus' wording of the question, we now understand that this was not just a conversation about the weekend, uh -uh, but this was an extremely emotional conversation that provoked sadness. It said they had sadness written on their faces. Now, two things I want to point out here, and then we, before we move on, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get going. So, so uh, the first thing I want to point out is that they were headed to Emmaus. Y'all yeah, with me? That's what the scripture said. They were headed to Emmaus. Emmaus is seven miles, seven miles from Jerusalem. They were headed to Emmaus. It was not Jerusalem. They were headed to Emmaus. They were headed to Emmaus. That means they were going away from Jerusalem. Stick with me. They, they, they were headed to Emmaus. That means they were headed away from Jerusalem. That meant that they were actually going in the opposite direction of the celebration of the resurrected Jesus. Did I lose y'all there? They were headed away from Jerusalem where they were celebrating Jesus, and they were going away from that party. And I just believe that if they had stayed with the other believers uh, at this time and not separated from them, that they would have found this uh, to be a time of celebration rather than a time of mourning. Because they're crying, there's sadness on their faces as they talked about Jesus and not happiness on their faces when they talk about Jesus. That's what confused me about some preachers. They talk about Jesus and they sound like they don't really like Jesus at all. <laughs> He's the Savior of my soul. Oh, how happy I am. Dude, when I'm talking about Jesus, I know how he hooked me up. I, I, I don't fit on, I don't, I, I'm not good, I, mm, hear me, I do it because they asked me to, but hear me, I don't like sitting on stages with, with, with preachers. Not that I don't like them, I don't like doing it. I just don't like doing it because I like to behave like y'all. Yeah. <laughs> and when you're on stage, you might be in front of the choir, you might be next to the pastor of the church, you know, all that kind of stuff. They like, sit down. I had one preacher say, he told me that. One preacher told me this. I'm not going to make this up. I'm not going to tell you who it was. He said, hey, because I praised him with singing and I was praising with him. The preacher told me that. He said, hey, you need not stand doing praise service. I'm like, why? He said, because you got to save your energy for the message. I said, I'm in good enough shape to stand. <laughs> I may not be in the best shape. And if I can't do that, I need to do something different. But he said, you need not stand for the praise service. Preachers don't do that because we, I don't know why. I don't fit in. And I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that. So when y'all see me up there, don't look at me. 
Because I got I to hold the solemn faith. The holy man faith, too. Amen. So y'all see this? I might be laughing or something. Glory! That's just going to open my mouth up, you know. Anyway, I don't know why I'm there. Uh, 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 but they were going in the opposite direction of the celebration, right? And I believe that they should have found this as a time of celebration rather than a time of mourning. That's the first thing. They were going in the wrong direction, right? Secondly, the Bible says in verse 17 that they had sadness written on their faces. Somebody say they. they. Say it again. Say they. they. This really ties back to point number one. Why? They were in this together. They were walking in the wrong direction together. You hear me? And they were intently discussing matters uh, that were uh, directly displayed a sadness on their faces. They were doing this together. They were in this, 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 this sadness to, together. I said that to say this to somebody who listens to me right now. I'm speaking to the prophetic. In this season where God is doing a new thing in you, you got to be careful of the company that you keep. Because, so I say because, say because, because keeping the wrong company can lead you in the wrong direction and get you into conversations that jack up your mood. Okay, 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 we're going to go ahead and go there. Like it or not, like it or not, there are certain people that's in your life who brighten your day with positivity. And there are certain people in your life that darken your day with their negativity. Just because they don't like something, they convince you that it's not good. Oh, y'all don't like that one. Just because they don't like it, they try to convince you that it is no good. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Just because they're distracted, they'll distract you. Y'all not going to get this one. Just because they don't feel the presence of the Lord, they make you feel like an oddball just because you do. Mm -hmm. And check this, check this, check this. Somebody say, check this, check, check, check this. One of those two followers' names was Cleopas. Now, y'all just laughing at my man's name. That ain't right. His name is Cleopas. Cleopas' name means vision of glory. Mm -hmm. But he doesn't see glory standing in his face. He, uh -huh, uh, he, he was talking to the man that he was just talking about. And he couldn't see him for who he was. <laughs> Neither could he hear or recognize his voice. And I'm just saying, I'm not blaming the other guy because we don't get his name, but we know Cleopas' name means vision of glory. I'm not blaming the other guy, but I am just saying, you need to be careful of the people in your circle in times of distress because sometimes it's quite possible that their misery will cause you to miss your miracle. You say, say it again, I'm going to do it because you told me to do it. His name is Cleopas. He has a vision of glory, but he doesn't see glory standing in his face. What I'm saying is you need to be careful of the people in your circle in the times of distress because it is quite possible that their misery will cause you to miss your miracle. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah, you come into church and you try to get yours, and all while you try to get in the service they, and to listen to the preacher, they talking to you about something else. You're like, Shh, I'm trying to get in the service. And they're talking about something completely different than service. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh, -huh, uh, -huh. And, and they're distracting your focus from reaching higher heights and deeper depths in Jesus. So, so I'm just saying, don't let someone close to you rob you of your miracle. Rex, I wasn't going to tell it, but I'm going to tell it anyway. Me and Rex had a conversation a couple weeks ago, and, you know, Rex is really holding on to God for a miracle to do something miraculous in his life. And Rex made me privy to some conversations that he had with different ones that were calling him up. We're like, you still alive? Yeah. Oh, y'all think we joking. He like, they, you, you still living? And, and he, Rex said, that, he said, they made me feel some kind of way because I dare believe that God's going to turn this thing around. And I said, Rex, don't you, don't you give them another second of your time to those people who can't help you believe God and trust that God's going to do something for you, if they got the nerve to call you up and say, you still living? You still alive? I thought you'd been dead by now. Why are you ain't But I say, right, hang up the phone. I know we don't do that anymore. Hang up the phone. People are foolish nowadays. You fool! I'm just reading the scripture. You, you, you. But you, how dare 
scare people. He said, man, I'm trying to hold on. And they called me up like, oh, I didn't think you were going to answer. I thought you was, I thought you were dead, but now putting stuff on Facebook, like, how dare you? How dare you? People that supposedly know you, how dare you? Don't let somebody close to you rob you of your miracle. Because if the wrong person get his ear, they'll distract everything he holding on to. That's why I told people, my faith is increasing because his faith is increasing. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Woo, people make me sick. I, I got to be careful what I say because I don't want to banish them to a place that I want to send them to because I want to say to what all of y'all, but I can't say that. I can't, Alfonso, but it wouldn't be right. That's a saint with sinner tendencies right there. Woo! Woo! But don't let nobody mess up your miracle because of their negativity. Because do you not know that there is a miracle looking for you? Woo! I say that because when we look at how this text is beginning to unfold, I've already established that they could not see nor hear Jesus for who he was. <laughs> but let's go back before they had this encounter on the road. These two men were headed in the wrong direction. Let's get that straight. These two men were headed away from where Jesus was resurrected. They were headed in the wrong direction. And while they were going in the, res the, the wrong direction, that's when Jesus intervened in their lives. Did you hear what I just said? When they were going in the wrong direction, that's when Jesus intervened in their lives. Now, I can't speak for none of y'all, but I can speak for me. But when God came into my life, I was headed in the wrong direction. He found me when I finally got to the end of me. Woo! Because I was headed in the wrong direction. Now listen, now listen, I know we say we found the Lord because that's what we learned in church. But the truth is, we have never found God because the reality is, God was never lost. We were. We were. And, 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 and he found us. So when he finds us, he inquires of us so that we can see where we are. At the moment of his inquisition, at the moment of his questioning, where are you? Do y'all remember he asked Adam? He said, Adam, where are you? Let me say this again. The Bible says he walked in the cool of the garden, and God, Adam was hiding in the garden. And God said, where are you? God was not looking for his location, but God was looking for his state of mind. And then when we study the scripture, we find out that Adam was all twisted up in the head because he, he didn't know how to take responsibility or accountability for himself. So the, long, the, story, the short of the story is, he said, God, yeah, I'm hiding. Who told you a naked man? Let me help you out, dog. That woman you gave me. Yeah, I was good, God, until you put me to sleep and you pulled that woman out of me. That woman you gave me. So all this mess that's happening out here now is your fault. Anyway, anyway, let me get back to the scripture. Anyway, the Bible said they stopped with sadness written across their faces uh, to answer Jesus' question. And they say to Jesus, I like verse 18. Do you have verse 18? Put that up there because this is real. They say, G you must be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about all the things that have happened there these last few days. I didn't ask you that. I asked you what y'all talking about. All the things that just happened. What things? He said, what things? And then they proceeded to give him a lengthy answer that in a nutshell said, we know the truth. We have the evidence. But we just don't believe, therefore we're sad. Did you catch that? They said the women that's part of us they said they went to the tomb and an angel told them that Jesus is alive. And then some of the men in our group ran down there and they too said, well, Jesus is alive because the tomb is empty. But we don't believe it. That's why we're sad. We thought he was going to do something for us, like, you know, save us from 
the Roman Empire, but he didn't do that. Therefore, we're sad. We, 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 thought, we thought he was going to do something real miraculous at the last moment. He didn't do that. Therefore, we're sad. We thought when he was up on that cross, he said, I could call on 12 legions of angels. And I thought the angels were going to come bear him off the cross. He didn't do that. Therefore, we're sad. As a matter of fact, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and he chose to die. Therefore, we're sad. And they're telling Jesus this story. And Jesus called them fools. The Bible says, he said, you foolish people. You, 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 you find it so hard to believe that all the prophecies written in the scriptures, wasn't it clearly predicted, verse 25, predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering his glory? Jesus is saying, you believe in the prophet, but you don't believe in the prophecy. He said, why do you have me stuck in the crucifixion instead of celebrating the resurrection? He said, you dare hold me captive in the cellar of my past instead of dwelling in the penthouse of my future. Somebody shout, you can't hold me down. Uh-uh, don't let people hold you down. They try to put you back into the place that you came from. Uh-uh, uh-uh. Jesus, I'm no longer on that cross. I'm no longer in that tomb, but I am resurrected. Somebody shout again and say, you can't hold me down. And the Bible says. And then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets, explaining from all the scriptures the things concerning himself. That's verse 27. He pointed out that out of everything that you've ever read in scriptures, they were pointing to me. Mm -hmm. But they still didn't see him for who he was. And the Bible lets us know that when Jesus finished talking, that they were right near Emmaus. And this is when the Bible says that Jesus acted, verse 28, acted as if he was going on. But we know he didn't go on. And he was never going on. Uh -huh. But this action of separation from them was to test to see if the effect his teachings had on their previously heavy hearts. Right? Right? Were they content to let the word pass them by? Or did the word lay an anchor in their soul and they wanted to have more? They desired to have more and they needed to have more. Well, the answer is in verse 30, 29. The Bible says they begged him to stay with them. I said, dog, you, you talking some good stuff right now. They begging. They begged. They said, come on. Can you stay with us? Look, man, it's dangerous out there. It's getting dark. Uh, there's kind of crooks out there. There's all kind of wild animals. Let's come in the house and talk some more. Hmm. Real quick, how valuable is the word in your life? How many of y'all said in your hearts, you ain't got to point. You, please don't raise your hand because it might hurt my feelings. But how many of you said in your hearts, man, I wish you'd hurry up. But how many of y'all say, I, I like the word. I, I like the word. I, I, I like the word. I, I want the word in my life. Somebody say, I need the word. Y'all didn't say, tell somebody, I need the word, man. Uh, I, need, I need the word. They, so they begged him to stay the night with them. Then check this out, verse 29. And, then he said, and he went home with them, verse 30. And when they had sat down to eat, Jesus took the bread. He blessed it. He broke it. And he gave it to them. And suddenly, somebody say suddenly. <laughs> suddenly their eyes were open and they recognized him. And at that moment, he disappeared. Ooh, this is good, y'all. This is some good stuff right here. Let me, let me, let me, share. Let me slow down and give y'all this because I don't want y'all to miss what I got. Here we go. We don't read when Jesus got to the house that he said, another, that he said a, a mumbling word. We don't, we don't see that Jesus said anything else in Scripture. When he got to the house, right? But he sat down with them. Yeah. My question to you today is, hmm, when was the last time you sat down with Jesus? Uh, I'll wait. Y'all got to answer. Sir. Yang. When was the last time you sat down with Jesus? Because to sit down with Jesus is a spiritual reality for the believer. Because what that means is our connection to the resurrected Christ, that means to sit with him, says that we will reap the benefit of his position of divine authority. Y'all missed that. Y'all missed that. If I'm going to sit with Jesus, that means that he's allowed me to sit with him. That means I'm going to reap the benefit of his divine authority. I'm going to say it again. For me to sit with Jesus means that he's allowing me to sit there. And if I'm going to sit with him, that means I'm reaping the benefit of his divine authority. Okay, let me help you out. The 
Bible says, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Are you hearing what I'm saying? That's Psalms 110 and 1. So, so he, said, he said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstools. So, so to sit with Jesus can't be only a Sunday morning experience. Yeah. Uh-uh, uh-uh. But you got to sit with him, sup with him, talk with him, connect with him. When? Daily. The Bible says in verse 30, and when they had sat down to eat, Jesus took the bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to them. And suddenly, somebody say suddenly. And suddenly their eyes were open. Somebody say open. Uh-huh. You see, the revelation that they received at the table was the climax of what they were taught on the road. Okay, Corey. What was taught on the road and what re- was revealed at the table. I'm glad y'all asked me. On the road, Jesus taught them that contrary to their belief that he had not come to set up a geographical, physical kingdom. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But that he had come to, to establish the kingdom of God. Mm-hmm. He said on the road, he taught them that he had not come to rescue Israel from the tyrannical reign of the Roman Empire, but that he had come to save them from their sins. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. And, and, yeah, listen, and he said, and, and this is going to happen. It's not going to be accomplished by some formal celebration or uh, from some pounding circumstance as being found in the coronation of a king. But he said, uh-uh, it's going to happen this way. He said, I was wounded for your transgressions. He said, I was bruised for your iniquities. And for the chastisement of our peace was laid upon him. And he said, by his stripes, we are healed. Y'all waiting for me to get my crown on. He said, "Uh uh-uh. He said, I was wounded for your transgressions. Woo! He said, I was bruised for your iniquities. Uh Uh-huh. He said, the chastisement of your peace. Every time you want peace, they beat me the more. And it was laid upon him. And he said, by or with my stripes, you are already healed. I don't know if y'all heard what I just said, but that's praise material right there. He didn't have to do it, but he did. This is what I want. All the self-righteous, I deserve all the blessings I get, saints, stay quiet. Somebody say, thank you, Jesus. Somebody say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Open your mouth and say, yeah. 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 Glory. Now give him a praise. Hallelujah. So, so that's what he taught him on the road. But then, y'all have to see, but then at the table, without speaking a mumbling word, he demonstrated with the bread that what he went through for them, that they would have to go through for him. Did y'all catch that? On the road, he talked to them. But at the table, he demonstrated to them that what he went through for them, that they would have to go through for him. The Bible says he took the bread, he blessed it, broke it, and gave it to them. Let me say that again. He took the bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to them. I'm going to say it again. He took the bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to them. He took the bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to them. Hear me. He takes you. He blesses you. He breaks you, and he gives you to the world. He takes you. He blesses you. He breaks you, and he gives you to the world. I'm just saying you can't be given to the world until God has taken you, and then he blesses you by his word, and then he breaks you, and then he gives you to the world. When was the last time you thanked God for the breaking season in your life? 
Yeah, 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 yeah. I give God praise for those breaking moments in my life because I discovered this, that he wasn't killing me. <laughs> he was blessing me. Boy, I felt like running right there. He, was, he wasn't killing me. He was blessing me. When was the last time you looked back and recognized that God had broke you, but he didn't break you for destruction, but he broke you to put you back stronger than you ever was before? Woo! He wasn't killing you. He was blessing you. I know that's a tough one to swallow. And hear me, hear me loud and clear. You refusing to be broken delays the blessings in your life. Because the miracle begins in the breaking. I got four people witness on that one. Because they don't want to be broken. I'm not saying you got to go through some more breaking, but you have been through some breaking before. The miracle God has for you began at the breaking moment in your life. Woo! Uh, and the more he takes you, the more he blesses you, and the more he breaks you, the more he empowers you so that you can meet the needs that you couldn't meet before because why? In the breaking, there comes multiplication is in the breaking. Baby, I'm talking good and here today. There's multiplication in the breaking. Are you hear what I'm saying? Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. That means that he strengthens me. Somebody say he strengthens me. Now, now philosopher Frederick Nietzsche, he said this. He said, he said, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. I know y'all trying to say Adele said that. She wasn't the first one to say that, baby. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. I'm talking to a lot of people who do not appreciate what you nearly escaped. And it broke you on the inside. You didn't think that you would overcome this one. You had said, if I had to go through that, I won't make it. Woo! If I had to go through that, I'd die. You're still here. You're still living. So what didn't break you, didn't break you, didn't kill you. It made you stronger. And I know I'm saying y'all don't like it. That's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. You don't have to like it. It's real. You don't have to have to like it. But but tell me one successful ministry that you may have or somebody you may know that wasn't broken sometime in their lives. But it's out of their brokenness, out of our brokenness that we're able to connect with broken people. I'm no better than y'all. I'm broken too. Uh huh. Uh huh. And, and I dare not elevate myself above others. Uh 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 uh. Because because I know what God has brought me from. That means that means just as much as I believe y'all need this food that I'm giving to y'all, I need this food that much more. I'm not serving y'all nothing I haven't eaten myself. And I tasted it, and it was good. And it strengthened me. It strengthened me. It straightened me up. It got me to where I needed to be. So I'm not just coming in the room throwing food at y'all saying, I hope it's good to y'all. Baby, I'm giving y'all something. I know it's good. And I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about his word. His word. Because we are vessels that are used by God. Which means what? Which means, check this out. This is key. Hear the wording which means that blessings flow through our hands and not from our hands. Blessings flow through our hands and not from our hands. Uh -huh. That means that God gets the glory. Not you, not me. God gets the glory. Mm -hmm. And you should never think that you are what the people need. Yeah. You can always find another pe me do some some do loud mouth guy that like to just dance around on stage and talk loud, uh -uh. but he'd never be Corey. Right. But if you just look for a mouthpiece, you can find another mouthpiece. So it's not me, but it's God's glory. Amen. Right. We're merely vessels used by God. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. I almost tuned up there, Twan. You missed it. But uh. The Bible says, and when they had sat down to eat, Jesus, what? Took the bread. 
blessed the bread, broke it, and gave it to them. And suddenly, somebody say suddenly, their eyes were open. I'm done, Elder Robert. I am. Antonio, you knew. I do have this one study note. I was, I, I was going to sit on it because it neither adds to the story nor takes away from it, but I was going to sit on it. I saw I was waiting for somebody to say, go ahead. If y'all didn't say, go ahead, I was going to. Here's the study note, Elder Curly. Uh, when I visualize myself sitting in a room with Jesus, because that's what I find myself doing here lately when I get into the Word of God, I, I find myself in the scene and I learn to look around the room and see what's happening. When I found myself in the room with Jesus and the two uh, men, the two followers, I, mm, I began to watch Jesus break the bed, bread. I saw him. I saw him. He, he took it. He blessed it. He broke it. And he gave it to the people. Here's my study note. When I was sitting in that room watching this, I visualized his hands. That was it. That was, that was it. Yes, of course, it has to be more than that. It is. Huh? So, so, do you remember I told you that one of the greatest witnesses that you can have is how you look on the other side of the trauma? <laughs> and, and then I said, in some cases, seeing is all the evidence you need. <laughs> oh, this is good. I'm just saying that, Elisa. That it's quite plausible, quite possible, that when Jesus was breaking the bread, that the disciples saw his hands. Come on, somebody go with me. Holmes, Holmes, if they saw his hands, they saw the nail prints in his hands. <laughs> and, and it would have been that, that when those nail scarred hands broke the bread and reached out to them to give it to them that the Bible said suddenly suddenly their eyes were open maybe you have not been around somebody that you didn't recognize them until they did something specific you're like wait a minute that's you Maybe that missed y'all. Jewish tradition is that it is the, 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 the patriarch of the house, the master of the house, who does the breaking of the bread in the house. The Bible says Jesus took the bread. This wasn't communion. There was no wine in here because the blood had already been spilled. He, he took the bread in the master of the man's house. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, okay, okay. Real good had a dinner this past weekend, and uh, the next time he have one, I'm just gonna walk in his kitchen and put him out, and uh, and I'm gonna serve whatever comes out the house. No, that's not the way it works. You don't go into somebody else's house and take over their dinner table. But Jesus, who was an invited guest in the house, when he had sat to meet with them, he he took the bread and they let him do it. He blessed the bread, and then he said, he broke the bread. And I'm just saying, when he was doing all that, it's quite possible that they saw the evidence. You're not just talking. You live this stuff you're talking about. I'm saying that sometimes when we're going through difficult times, that we don't recognize that God is with us. And sometimes it's only when we look back that it becomes very clear that it was the hand of God that was guiding us. It was the hand of God that was protecting us. 
It was the hand of God that was directing us. It was the hand of God that was instructing us. It was the hand of God that was moving in our lives the whole time. And I'm just saying that when they saw his hands, they saw that it was his hands that was doing the breaking, that suddenly their eyes were open. Stand to your feet. And with that revelation, put 32 up there, Delshawn. The Bible said they said to one another, didn't our hearts burn? within us as he talked with us on the road and explained the scriptures to us. I'm trying to show you that these, these previously saddened hearts were now burning hearts. Jeremiah said it's like fire shut up in my boat. Now you can't go to no other public venue and yell fire, but I give you the authority on the count of three to shout fire with everything you got. One, two, three, fire! Shut up in my bone. And the Bible says, Elder Robert, in verse 33, that the fire was burning in them so much so. 33 up there. Check that out. Within the hour, they were going back to Jerusalem. You got me, brother. You finally got it. He said, he's going back to Jerusalem, which meant that they were going in the right direction. They got to Jerusalem and told the good news that Jesus is alive. That means they turned in the right direction, which means that after their encounter with Jesus, they found it imperative to get their lives together. One last time, somebody say, I got to get my life together. How do we do that? We have this encounter with Jesus and we turn everything over to him. If you're willing to do this right now, if you're willing to do this right now, I believe God's gonna meet you right where you are and truly give your everything to God. Once again, these disciples one time knew who Jesus was, but they failed to believe everything Jesus said. But I want you to believe what God has said and what he has done for you and that he paid the price that you and I don't have to pay anymore. He sacrificed his life way back on Calvary. And if you wanted to say this with me, I believe God got a new thing for you. Make this new commitment. Maybe you saved already. Maybe you say, you know what, Corey, I did some bad things this week. I said some bad stuff this week. I had some bad attitude this week. Say, Father, I need you in my life. Save me from myself. Save me from my sins. So I confess with my mouth, the Lord Jesus, I believe in my heart that he died on the cross for me. So I also believe that they put him in a tomb just for me. And I also believe that he got up with all power in his hands for me. And for that reason, this day, I decree and I declare that I am saved. Say it again. I am saved. Say it again. I am saved. Only if you believe it. Give God a praise.